Hello and welcome everyone. Today I will be talking about something that most UG medical students should be knowing about but quite often fail to because there is no one to tell them about it. Hello there, I am Ocean Behel and today is the second video of the series called UG Research 101 on this channel. In the first video, I had told you about research topics and how to choose one. Many students came up with a lot of interesting ones like is PUBG bad for students? Bad marks and depression? WHO guidelines for COVID. Now, one thing that I want you guys to ask yourself is are these even research topics? Is this even research? Today that is exactly what I'm going to be talking about. Today we are going to be talking about an introduction to research and also the important steps in research. Research can be defined as a process of solving problems and resolving previously unanswered questions. These previously unanswered questions are also known as a research gap or a knowledge gap, which can further lead to a research question. But this process needs to be systematic. That is, it needs to be a structured activity that has things like defining variables, constructing hypotheses, and developing research designs. Now, the reason I'm focusing so much on the systematicity of research is, for example, if you construct and distribute a questionnaire before determining the expected outcome. Now, if you do this, then the outcome might not actually match the expected outcome and hence it will be a wasted effort and that is something I think no student wants. Now let's explore the topics that I had mentioned in the beginning of this video. For example, bad marks and depression. The first thing that comes to mind is, in which direction will you be going? Are you going to ask yourself whether bad marks cause depression or whether depression leads to bad marks? Which is exactly why research needs to follow a direction or it needs to be logical. Now this logic in research can be of two types. One is known as an inductive logic. Now I know this sounds like a very new thing, but it's quite logical. For example, a COVID patient was found to have lung opacities. Now this is an observation. Now, if more COVID patients are found to have lung opacities, then you're forming a pattern this further leads to a theory that lung opacity is seen in COVID. Hence, an inductive logic goes from an observation to a theory. But the issue with inductive logic is that it can be invalidated. That is, if you find 50 patients with lung opacities, then if you find the 51st patient without lung opacities, then it is invalidated. But an inductive logic can never be proven. The second type of logic is a deductive logic. That is, you start with a theory. For example, lung opacity is seen in COVID. You then form a hypothesis based on this theory. That is, if a person is COVID positive, they will have lung opacities. Now, you need to collect data to test this hypothesis. Hence, in this case, you will collect chest x-rays of COVID patients. After this, you will need to analyze the data and see if you need to accept or reject the hypothesis. For example, in this case, if the confidence level is 95%, then if less than 950 patients have lung opacities, then you will reject the hypothesis. Don't worry, I'll be talking about all these big words, confidence intervals, confidence levels in the upcoming videos.
Now the problem with deductive logic is that the conclusions will only be true if the premises are clear. For example, when we are talking about lung opacity seen in COVID patients, are we saying that it is seen in the first few days? Are we saying that it is only seen in a particular group of patients affected by COVID? So this hypothesis will not apply since the premises of this theory were not clear. Now, let's look at the second topic, that is, is PUBG bad for students? This question can be answered in two ways. In a philosophical way, by saying that uh, PUBG has ruined my life or it helps me relieve stress, or it can be answered with research. That is, you can find out whether PUBG improves students' performance, if it affects their mental health. Now, these are both logical disciplines. But what makes research stand apart from something like philosophy is that it is empirical in nature, which quite basically means that it is based on data and not personal experiences. But this is one of the things that makes research very difficult for physicians because we tend to believe more what we observe than the general data that is available. That's why it's very important to remember that when you're confronted by data that doesn't support the hypothesis, always discard the hypothesis and not the data, unless there is a fundamental flaw in your research design. And this will be found by other researchers. And that's why research needs to be replicable and transmittable. What replicability means is that other people should be able to use your research design in their research, thus validating your own research. And transmissibility allows subsequent studies. And what this means is that spread your research as much as you can by presenting and publishing your research. If you might also remember, I had mentioned about your research being used in subsequent studies in my last video, when I had mentioned the importance of your study being able to help another researcher in the future. Another thing that I had mentioned in my last video was data collection and how important it is. But what if it cannot be generalized? Then is it really research at all? The answer is no, because Another big characteristic of research is that it needs to contribute to generalizable knowledge. Now, this knowledge can be expanded by different types of research. There are three basic types. The first one being basic, fundamental or pure research, which aims to expand knowledge by exploring ideas. An example of this is finding out the correlation between a certain disease and levels of a certain chemical in the body, which is something that's quite often done in biochemistry research. The second type of research is applied research, which aims to find solutions to current problems and apply them in a diagnostic, therapeutic or prognostic way. For example, clinical trials of new drugs or better diagnostic methods. The third type that links these two is translational research that translates results in two main ways. Translational research can translate results of laboratory research more rapidly into clinical practice and vice versa. This is also known as bench to bedside and back or T1 type of translation. The second type is from clinical practice to the population at large, and this is also known as to the community and beyond and back, or also as T2 type of translation. Now, these three are not the only types of research. There are so many more, such as prospective and retrospective, one goes ahead in time and one is based on old data. 
It can also be longitudinal or cross-sectional. Longitudinal being that you observe people over a period of time, while in cross-sectional you quite literally see events that happen in a cross-section of time, such as prevalence studies. It can also be descriptive or analytic. Descriptive basically talks about what kind of problems you see in the population, while analytic talks about how or why those problems occur. It can also be observational or experimental, which is basically based on the amount of control that the researcher has on the study population. In observational studies, you are not allowed to intervene, whereas in experimental studies, you often provide interventions which lead to different types of results in two types of groups. It can also be quantitative versus qualitative. Quantitative depends on measuring variables in a big population and uh, analyzing it, while qualitative data can often depend on personal experiences such as narratives or focus groups. Now, don't worry about this because I am going to be talking about all of these in detail in the future studies. For now, I'm just going to be talking about the basic steps of research. In my last video, I had mentioned the steps you can follow to achieve a research topic. And as you can see, I love flowcharts. So I'm going to give you another one for this video. So you have a research topic now. The next thing you're supposed to do is identify relevant variables which are dependent variables, which is what you are trying to see. Independent variables, which will be affecting your dependent variables and confounding variables, which will be present, but should be eliminated in certain ways. Don't worry again, I will be talking about this. Then you need to formulate your research design. That is, you need to define your sampling technique, your sample, and calculate your sample size. You need to define the timings and sequence of measurements. You also need to define comparison groups and how you're going to be controlling bias. And you need to define the data collection instruments and plans. Are these available since before? Are you going to make them? And you need to decide statistical analysis in order to minimize spurious associations. Now, I am sure many of you might have already read about this, but I will again be talking about these more in detail in the video on making research protocols. You then need to collect your data, analyze it, and then conclude. And voila, your research is done. I am sure all of you will be able to go through your research and if any of you have done it or are interested in seeing others research then you can join this conference that's happening on Saturday which is also known as Research for All and it's being organized by the Student Research Council of Mimer and you guys can reach out to us through this email ID or on Instagram and you can sign up through the link in the description. I will see you in the next video and also be there for the live on Friday. Bye-bye.